Mill and Liberalism, Maurice Cowling, Second Edition, Introduction. Each generation of scholars, and within each generation each group, takes the past left by its predecessors, makes what alterations it thinks it can justify, and constructs for itself a world from which it has emerged. This process occurs over all areas of scholarly activity. It occurs over all areas of history. It occurs, more even than elsewhere, in interpreting writers from earlier generations have chosen. It occurs, more even than elsewhere, in interpreting writers whom earlier generations have chosen, for reasons as various as their experiences, to regard as quote, great moral teachers, unquote. This process must be carried out by each generation for itself. It cannot be done for it by the generation before, and it cannot be done by the generation after. Their experiences are different from its own. The weight of their emphasis will be different also. It can be done only by those who are in some sense contemporary, and there is no other way of doing it than by studying the texts. Not everyone will recognize the experience of the author by whom this book is written, but some will understand the hostility to Mill, which arises from suspicion of the claim to impartiality rationality, and unquestionable self-evidence from which liberal opinions and progressive policies have been propagated through all political parties and most political journals in the 18 years which have elapsed since the end of the war of 1939. In other work, the author has set out objections to the academic predominance of this style of thinking the present work is a continuation of that one. The reason why uh, I chose to uh, read that short little excerpt from the beginning uh, of Mill and Liberalism by uh, Maurice Cowling uh, is there's sometimes... I feel the creation of not only false, but even uh, unnecessary divides. And uh, one simple example is that between uh, being traditional and being progressive. And there is the idea that if one... Uh, in particular to the former, that if one is a traditionalist, then this means that uh, one is wholly uh, uncontemporary, which is actually quite false. And as was alluded to in the introduction, right, every generation uh, will have the obligation to engage with what uh, came before it, even if it either decides uh, as a choice or byproduct of that engagement to essentially continue uh, in the direction of its predecessors, uh, or as a means to uh, live in the moment with the collective wisdom uh, of what came before, of course, there will uh, undoubtedly be a need to engage all of those, uh, all, you know, all of those texts, all of those ideas, all of those authors, all of those uh, men and women. It will be necessary to do so uh, in the modern context, right? I mean, in, uh, or rather, like in the time in, in which you live, which, of course, you know, whenever you are living, uh, that is the modern context. 
And as I said, there is sometimes a, an unnecessary uh, dichotomy, not only a false one. Uh, and so sometimes I feel that uh, some people uh, fork or branch off into uh, certain modes of uh, liberal or progressive thinking uh, out of a uh, misconstrued idea that uh, not simply that the past has uh, no value uh, as it relates to the present, uh, but that uh, the past will become some type of quagmire, right? If we get caught or bogged down uh, in the, uh, you know, if we get bogged or caught down in the past, uh, then uh, somehow we will become uh, beholden to it versus um, a fresh application of what came before in the modern context. And so, um, you know, I liked how he did, uh, if I can bring it back up here really quick. Um, you know, he did mention something about, um, some of the, you know, what, what are, what are really some of the complaints, uh, that he has again, of course, he's listening here, John Stuart Mill, right? When he says Mill and liberalism, uh, probably could have told you that in the beginning, right, is, is referring to really the, the, the uh, founding father, so to speak, of uh, modern liberalism, at least, John Stuart Mill. And he, he wrote, he said, you know, some will understand the hostility of the author, meaning, to uh, John Stuart Mill, which arises from suspicion of the claim to impartiality. Uh, I agree with that, in that... Um, Many, uh, uh, or at least what I hear, much of the charge that is levied against traditionalists um, is that they are uh, incapable of uh, being impartial and that uh, progressives, uh, for no other reason than being progressive, or liberals for no other reason than being liberal, are somehow able to uh, invoke or conjure up uh, an impartiality that seems uh, to evade or even be beyond the pale of possibility uh, for traditional, uh, traditionally minded uh, thinkers or traditionalists. Uh, the second part, he says, what, this, this, uh, the, this, this claim to rationality, and we hear that a lot, uh, that, you know, we have to have a, a rational way of thinking about this or that. As, you know, one, uh, it's a word that is, uh, I think it's a word that is uh, applied, but not uh, very well uh, understood, and that, of course, going back to the, the root right, ratio, um, you know, not everything is about a ratio. Uh, some circumstances will call for that, but certainly uh, not all. And just like uh, the the complaint and the suspicion against impartiality, what uh, is that one uh, pre-modern or traditional thinking and its conclusions are somehow uh, impossibly irrational, while uh, the bedrock of modern liberal progressive thinking uh, is somehow uh, uh, more rational. And of course, in this, right, uh, rationality is kind of uh, made into a virtue. Um, and then uh, the third part that he lists here about what the unquestionable self evidence. And that is one of the things that I object to about, I guess, a lot of progressive uh, uh, thought is that it's just sort of self-referential, meaning that it doesn't tend to argue its points very well. Even in some cases where, say, um, maybe the conclusion might be the same as that in a traditional sense, 
but the premises, right, the argument of how to get to that conclusion, right, uh, is little more than self-referential. I suppose in a way some people might say that about uh, uh, rationalism, I mean uh, uh, traditionalism. My counter to that would be that, um, you know, one of the, I guess you could say, one of the bedrocks of traditional thinking is that, well, one thing that tradition has going for it, generally, is that uh, the contents and the portents of traditional thinking, you know, have a track record to go with them to show like, hey, this has worked. Now, that doesn't mean um, when it doesn't work that we uh, should uh, just simply uh, cling to uh, whatever those conclusions were simply to be traditional. Um, at the same time, uh, nor should they be jettisoned uh, merely to be modern or to be progressive. Um, and so I, I, I kind of agree with those three suspicions, uh, as he calls them, right? The, the, the suspicion, uh, suspicions of impartiality, rationality, and unquestionable self evidence. Um, and so I, I definitely, um, I've been labeled, I've been labeled and I've been labeled and continue to be labeled, uh, a lot of things. Um, and, uh, out of that, uh, cornucopia of labels, uh, I have been labeled a conservative. I have been labeled, uh, on, uh even on a few occasions, a traditionalist or neo traditionalist. Um, and I would probably say that out of all those, the closest would probably be uh, the last part. In that being, yes, I would say I am neo because I am new. I mean, um, you know, I was born fifty just about fifty years ago, so I guess that makes me new. Um, and uh, you know, certainly um, also the idea of applying, uh, the traditional in the modern. So that's that, 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 that sort of part of the Neo I, I accept and unapologetically certainly am a, uh, traditionalist. Um, and so in a lot of my writings, uh, teaching, uh, my approach, uh, to Islam has undoubtedly been, uh, through the methodology and the framework and the window of our tradition, uh, fully recognizing that that tradition is not uh, monolithic or one thing, but nor is it uh, schizophrenic, <laughs> right? Where while it may not be monolithic in one thing, uh, it isn't just, uh, you know, it isn't just a whole bunch of things either. Right. Uh, and certainly, uh, there are some qualities, uh, that do come to define it, no matter how broad, uh, those strokes are. So, um, we'll be going and dealing, uh, a little bit more, uh, with this book. Uh, Cow uh, Cowling is one of the uh, authors, uh, and I think I may have mispronounced his, his, his last name as, uh, Cowley or Crowley. I don't know why it's actually, uh, Cowling, C-O-W-L-I-N-G. So we'll probably in the, in the coming, uh, uh, in the coming podcasts, um, one, I will try to do a, a complete review, um, of this particular, uh, work of Cowling's. And we'll probably also deal with a few other works uh, that explore the uh, the ideas of uh, John Stuart Mill, because he is an incredibly important figure in terms of the the, the moment that we live in in trying to sort of create a, a genealogy of the ideas uh, that are holding great sway. Uh, at the moment in the time that we live. And I think it's important for us as Muslims uh, to be able to 
understand those uh, and indeed perhaps even uh, reverse engineer some of them and to be cognizant of the effects that those uh, movements have had, uh, those philosophies, those writers, those movements uh, that they have had on our own community and on our own thinking and our own understanding of uh, Islam in the uh, in the current context in which we live. So, inshallah, I uh, hope you'll enjoy uh, these little uh, tidbits, and inshallah, we, we hope to have more to come soon. Wa salli wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.